Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And please open to the book of Acts, chapter 8. I hope you all know where the book of Acts is by now. Not, <laughs> we're not doing a very good job here. <laughs> so the book of Acts, chapter 8. Um, let me mention just quick, if um, any of you would like information on our ministry, we have the table in the back on the left, Richard is on the right, and uh, we have a newsletter back there and some other information. And if you would like to receive our letters or some emails that I send out when I'm in Asia, just leave us that information, we'd be happy to do so. Uh, just a quick update, about a year ago, we were informed that we have to vacate the orphanage building that we've been renting. The, the owner died and passed down to her children and they wanted to use the land and building for other purposes. Um, at first we were told that we had to be out in two weeks. So it was a bit of a panic situation. But Pakinata was able to talk them into being a little more reasonable, um, quite a bit more reasonable in fact, and they extended it to two years. So, um, so we've purchased the land now. And many of you have been praying for the situation and also contributed. And so we, uh, we greatly appreciate that. We have the land. And you know, there's all, as you can imagine, somewhat, but not entirely, there's all kinds of government permits and regulations and you know, this and that. So we've been dealing with all that. Uh, but that's pretty well all finally taken care of. And, we built a temporary shed on the land to store the cement and other materials. And, um, and we dug a well. We went down <coughs> 80 feet and found water, but they suggested we go 500 feet. Because it's, uh, that area doesn't get a lot of rain. And especially in years when the monsoon rains come, but they actually don't come, it's very dry. So going down 500 feet, we should be OK. So that's kind of where we're at now. So thank you again for that, and I will keep <coughs> All right, Acts chapter 8. Uh, let's have a word of prayer at the beginning. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather together as saints and rejoice in what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and rejoice that we have the very word of God. And I thank you that as we continue to study through this book that we can get an understanding of things that took place uh, many years ago and yet still have a big impact on the world today. Things that we could never know had you not given us this information. And we thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple things before we actually begin reading the text. Let me ask you a question. Who is the most influential person in human history? Had most influence in the course of the world. That's what you say. Why do you know the answer? You're scared to say so in case you might be wrong. <laughs> so who would, who would you say is the most influential person in human history? Jesus Christ. Okay, I heard somebody say Jesus Christ, and that you can't argue with that. So that certainly is true. So then, who is the second most influential <laughs> person? Or if you don't count Jesus Christ, because he was, of course, man, but he was also God, uh, who is the most influential. And I heard someone say Paul. And I would absolutely agree with that. Um, and I've actually read uh, several unbelieving people who have studied history and written about history make that same claim, that he is the most influential person in human history. When you look at what he, the, in, the impact that he had, not only during his lifetime, but still today very much, um, I would say that he is the most influential. Now, the second thing I want to mention again before we read the text is, um, it is true, as Jim was just saying, that Act 7 is, is a dividing line, in a sense, uh, a very significant event, no doubt, in the Bible. But as we go through chapter 8, we have to keep in mind that the, the people that we encounter in chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and Simon and so forth, they have not in any way whatsoever been influenced by the doctrine for the dispensation of the grace of God. 
Because Saul, as we will see as we enter this chapter, Saul is still in unbelief. So he has not received one word of the revelation of the mystery, nor has anyone else. The dispensation of grace is unknown yet. Church of body of Christ has not begun. So none of that has any influence over what anyone thinks or does in Acts chapter 8. Everything that they think and do is based on what's written in the Old Testament, what John the Baptist and Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what uh, Peter and John and, and, uh, uh, and Stephen taught in the first seven chapters in the book of Acts. That's all they know. All right, so let's begin Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Now, as we read through chapter 7, uh, we see in chapter 7 and verse 58, and cast him out of the city, Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now at that point, when you are reading through the Bible, you start with Genesis and you come to Acts 7, 58, you think, who, who in the world is this guy? Saul. First time I ever heard of him. And why, why would he be significant? Why, why do we care what his name is? And at this point, we don't know. But there must be something because God bothers to put his name here. Then we come to chapter 8, verse 1, and he shows up again, though. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And again, at this point, we still don't know, you know what, what's so special. Why is this guy a big deal that God would even mention him? We continue in verse 1. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women committed them to prison. So uh, Saul was consenting <coughs> unto his death, and for some reason that's really important. We don't really know why at this point, but for some reason it obviously is. And then there's a great persecution against the church, but notice it's the church which was at Jerusalem. They know nothing yet about any church of body of Christ. There's not one word has been spoken about that has not yet begun. So this is the church at Jerusalem. And they're scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now there is a, a pretty popular, pretty common idea that uh, they go back, well, let's go, let's go back and read Matthew 28, uh, what is commonly in the, in the Christian world commonly called the Great Commission. Now, there's a couple of problems with that term, Great Commission. I, many years ago, I became very conscious of words and terms that people use that are not in the Bible. And, and I... I find it's very important that we kind of, anytime someone does that, I'm not saying I don't do it or that you don't do it, but anytime somebody does that, a red flag ought to go up. Because oftentimes there's something we better be wary of there. Just one quick example, the word sovereign. Now, I don't know how many times in my life I was in discussions with someone and they would say, well, one thing we know or one thing we all agree is that God is sovereign. And, and years ago, I'd say, yeah, I can't argue with that, until I found out that that word is not in the Bible. None. So if you ask me, do you believe God is sovereign, I have to ask you, what do you mean by that? And, and whatever you mean by that, you can't define it from the Bible, because the word is not in the Bible. And of course, if, you, if somebody says God is sovereign, I've come to realize that there's a whole theological package that comes with that word. If I would say to you now, God is sovereign, again, there's a whole theological system that comes with that one word. So I'm not going to say I believe God is sovereign, because the Bible doesn't say that. I'm also not going to say I don't believe he's sovereign, because the Bible doesn't say that either. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? That's what I would have to find out. And so the same thing with the term Great Commission. Um, that, that term is not in the Bible. And so when people label, for example, Matthew 28, that this is the Great Commission, first of all, there are many commissions in the Bible. And the first one is in the first chapter in the Bible. And they're all great. 
Every commission that God gave is, is great, but none of them are labeled the great commission. Um, and so in Matthew 28, and this again is what is often called the great commission, beginning in verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto them, uh, sorry, given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Uh, who did he speak this to? If you look at verse 11, it's the 11 disciples. Judas Iscariot is no longer there, so there are only 11. Then turn to Acts chapter 1. And we can also look at the end of Mark and Luke and John and, and look at the commissions there. But Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. And so there's another set of instructions that they're given in their commission. And so oftentimes, you go back to chapter 8, oftentimes it is taught that Jesus had given them this great commission, to go into all the world, um, Luke says beginning at Jerusalem, but then also Judea, Samaria, and, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But they were refusing to obey the commission God had given them. And so God had to send this great persecution to drive them out, <coughs> to force them out of Jerusalem to go and preach to all the world as he had told them to do. So I, I don't know if you, I know some of you have heard that, but if you've not, that's a pretty common, pretty popular way of interpreting these first eight chapters in the book of Acts. So that's what God is doing here with this great persecution. In verse one, he's forcing them to be scattered abroad outside of Jerusalem to make progress in carrying out this commission. But there are a number of problems with that. First is you read chapter eight, verse one, it's very clear that they leave because of a persecution. And there's no indication that God caused this persecution. These are, you know, this is Saul who's in unbelief who's leading this persecution, not God. And then if you notice in verse four, it says, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So this is, very much a verse that they would use. And see, this, see, this is exactly what God intended. That they were scattered abroad to carry out this great commission that they were refusing to carry out. They were staying in Jerusalem. Now, and sometimes it's presented that they were cowardly. But if you notice, and we'll mention this in a moment again, if you notice the, the apostles in verse one stay in Jerusalem. So if they were cowardly, why would they stay right in the place where the great persecution is taking place? So that, that's not going to fly. And then there, you know, there's other, they were fleshly and, and this and that, so God had to force this issue. Um, look over at chapter 11 and verse 19. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, so that's the people we're talking about in chapter 8, verse 1, traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, and now notice, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So that kind of messes up that whole idea. When they were scattered outside of Jerusalem, they didn't start preaching to the Gentiles and going all over the world. They preached to none but the Jews only. Okay, back in chapter eight and verse one. <clears throat> And so they're, they're scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. But again, we know they're only preaching to the Jews. And then it says at the end of verse 1, except the apostles. So even at this point with this great persecution, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Now, there's also something I, I've read and heard a number of times that, that the apostles knew that salvation, and they'll, they use Acts chapter 1, verse 8 for this, that first Jerusalem must be saved. 
And so the apostles were going to stay in Jerusalem until Jerusalem was saved, because it surely is not here in chapter 8, verse 1. They just stoned Stephen. But first Jerusalem must be saved, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. But turn back to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. And as you're turning back to Zechariah, something very important to keep in mind, when we talk about salvation now in this dispensation of grace, we talk about individual salvation. So you're saved, you're saved, that guy across the street is not saved. We talk about individuals. Paul talks about individuals being saved. He doesn't talk about nations being saved, other than his desire that the nation of Israel would be saved. Uh, but as the revelation of the mystery was fully revealed to him, he understood that's not going to happen in this dispensation. So we are, we're familiar with thinking about individuals being saved. But when we get outside of Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, you have to keep in mind that Oftentimes, it is not talking about individuals being saved. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes not. Oftentimes, it's talking about the, the nation being saved, the nation of Israel being saved. And so, to understand what's going on here in Acts chapter 8 and why everybody does what they do, you also have to keep that in mind. Not try to read this dispensation salvation into what was going on there in Acts 8. Um, so, Zechariah chapter 12, and um, let's start in verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day. Okay, when is that day? Many, many times in the Old Testament you read, that day. It shall come to pass in that day. It's the second coming of Christ. So, whenever you see that, that's the day it's talking about. Okay, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. <clears throat> and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So when will Jerusalem mourn? When will they repent? Not until the second coming of Christ. Not until they look upon him whom they have pierced. So, is it, is it the case that the apostles or the, the disciples are, are not to leave Jerusalem until Jerusalem is saved? Well, if that's the case, then they can't leave Jerusalem until after the second coming of Christ. Because Jerusalem will not mourn, they will not repent until that time. Also, while we're here in Zechariah, look at chapter 13 and verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So again, they will, they will look upon him. And there are many other things we could look at the Old Testament um, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, beginning the book of Acts, that as we come to chapter 8, the disciples know there are a number of things that must take place before the second coming of Christ and before Jerusalem is saved. Now turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, he calls the 12 unto him. And then verse 2, these are the names of the 12 apostles. Verse 5, these 12, Jesus set forth, and he gives them instructions. Then you come down to verse 16. Behold, I send you forth the sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men. For they, well, before I continue reading, let me ask you, as we continue with verse 17, as we read these verses, I want you to ask, did these things take place to the apostles, to the disciples, um, in, in Acts chapter 8 or before Acts chapter 8? All right, verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. 
and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought, and, and so forth. So have these things, when we come to Acts chapter 8, have these things happened to the disciples? That they have not. So very clearly, as you go through Matthew 10 here, um, the, the instructions through verse 15 are instructions that they were to carry out at that time. But when you come beginning in verse 16, he is now talking about that time of the 70th week of Daniel. That's when these things will take place. So in Acts chapter 8, these things have not yet taken place. And then, uh, so we read through verse 18, then there's 19, 20, uh, 21, and let's pick it up again in verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. So that they were persecuted in Jerusalem, and they all were scattered abroad. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So clearly he tells them way back in Matthew chapter 10, that before the second coming of Christ, they're going to be going through the cities of Israel. But they won't complete that until he comes. So they are not told you have to stay in Jerusalem until Jerusalem is saved, which won't take place until the second coming of Christ. Uh, now, keep in mind what it says here in, in Matthew 10, 23. Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. They won't even complete going through the cities of Israel before he comes. And then look at chapter 24 in Matthew. And notice what he tells them in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. He says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, how can it be that he just said in Matthew 10, you won't even complete going through all the cities of Israel before the second coming? But here in Matthew 24, 14, he says the gospel is going to be preached in all the world for a witness before the second coming of Christ. So how, how do these things square up? And that's a big topic that we don't have time to get into all that, but I just want to point out these, these two verses to... To make the point, there are a number of things going on here in this time frame. And, and there are a number of, if we want to say, different commissions that are taking place here during this time frame. Matthew 10 is one, Matthew 24 is another one, carried out by different people. Uh, then you come to the book of Revelation, you have 144,000, you have two witnesses. And so there are a number of things going on here, they're not all the same thing. Okay, then back in Acts chapter 8. Um, and so, when we come to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and we see what the disciples do, and we see what the 12 do, we have to put all this in the time frame of what has been revealed prior to this, and not bring in things that have not yet been revealed through Paul. Okay, uh, chapter 8 and verse 3, it says, As for Saul, so here he is again, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed to prison. Um, you've heard a little bit about Saul already today, and Richard in the next message will surely be talking a great deal more about him when he talks about chapter 9. But I want to just read a couple other passages and, and just let it sink in who this guy really is. All right, so you see what it says here in the first three verses of chapter 8. Then go to chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, and let's pick it up in verse 4. This is, at this point, Paul speaking. Uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death. By the way, somebody asked today about what, you know, before they were called Christians, what were they called? Well, here's another thing. It was called this way, or the, the, the way. All right, I persecuted this way unto the death. So notice, unto the death. This is a nasty guy we're talking about here. 
binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He didn't even limit it to men. He, he went after the women too. As also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I receive letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. He was not content only with persecuting the saints and, and having saints put to death in Jerusalem. <coughs> that wasn't good enough. Now he wants to go other places, and so he has authority to go to Damascus. Verse 6, And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and I'll stop there because Rich will be talking about that, in chapter 26 in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 26. And we'll pick it up in verse 9. He says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's who this guy was. That was his passion. That was his devotion in life, is to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. He was all for, he was not only in favor of stoning Stephen to death, he was in favor of having many other men and women put to death and, and played a significant role in that happening. Verse 11, and I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them I persecuted them even unto strange cities whereupon as I went to Damascus and so again I'll stop there right and one more in Galatians chapter 1 Galatians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 13 he says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now, of course, he's not talking about the church of body of Christ because that wasn't even in existence. He's talking about the church of Jerusalem and then those even in other cities like Damascus. Okay, verse 14, And profited in the Jews' religion, above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. What was Paul, Paul obviously had a great, great zeal. What was he zealous for? For the word of God? For the law of Moses? No. He was zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, and I'll stop there again, because Richard will be picking the story up. All right, back to Acts chapter 8. So that's a little, gives us a picture of who this guy Saul is. He's a bad, bad guy. All right, then let's continue in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Philip either. He has been mentioned back in chapter 6. But other than that, but here he is. He goes down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Uh, note in verse 7 what, what was taking place here. There's unclean spirits being cast out and there's healing taking place. Is that anywhere else in the Bible do you think of that happening? Is that Romans through Philemon? No. Barney made that point clear as others. We're not talking here about what Romans through Philemon. These are the two signs of the kingdom, of the gospel of the kingdom, that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that's still what's taking place here. This is not a departure from the gospel of the kingdom. It's, it's all continuing. Okay, then um, verse 8. And there was great joy in that city. But there is a certain man called Simon, 
which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. We, it's not a word you hear commonly, but there's a word today called simony. And it comes from this guy. That's where he got the word. And uh, if you look in the dictionary, the definition of simony is the buying or selling of ecclesiastical privileges, the making of profit out of sacred things. So that's, this is where that word came from, from Simon. Continue in verse 10. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is a great power of God, and to him they had regard because of that, uh, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So Philip here goes into a city of Samaria. He's outside of Jerusalem now. And he's not doing that because of the dispensation of grace. I mean, he knows nothing of any of that. He's outside of Jerusalem, preaching in the city of Samaria. And notice in verse 12 again, um, when they believed Philip concerning preaching the things, what? Concerning what? The kingdom of God. He's not preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. He's preaching to them about the kingdom of God. And, uh, and the name of Jesus Christ. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what did, at least one or two speakers have, have mentioned this and read a couple verses. What did they have to believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to be saved? Well, they couldn't believe Jesus died for their sins because he hadn't died. So they, they couldn't believe that. What did they have to believe? They had to believe that Jesus is the Christ. They had to believe in his name. So what is Philip preaching to them, and what are they believing in chapter 8, verse 12? They, he, he preached and they believe the name of Jesus Christ. This is not the gospel that we preach today. Um, and, and they were baptized. All, all of this clearly speaks of the past dispensation, both men and women. And okay, then verse 13, then Simon himself and Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So here's a guy who's been, he's wowed the city of Samaria for a long time, fooling them and thinking that he had power with his sorceries. But when he sees real power here with Philip, he wonders at it. Verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now notice they believed, and they're saved before Peter and John come. Mm -hmm. Peter and John didn't have to be there for them to believe to have eternal life. That's already taken place. They, so why did Peter and John come, as it says in verse 15, that they might receive the Holy Ghost? For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now where in the Bible is it that people are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but they don't receive, uh, as it says again in verse 15, the Holy Ghost? Well, that has to take us before Acts chapter 2. Because it's not until Acts chapter 2 that they receive the Holy Ghost. So here are some, some who believe in the city of Samaria, and they're baptized. So they're back again, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they need to get up to speed and get up to the Acts 2 program. And so that's why Peter and John come there, to get them up to speed with the current dispensational situation. As we study the Bible, not only do we have to rightly divide an understanding that there's time past and there's now, but even within time past, there are times like in the book of Acts where things are rapidly changing, and we have to rightly divide that. And so these, um, these believers here in Acts chapter 8, verse 15, 16, they're believers, they have eternal life, but they're not quite with the program yet. So they need to get rightly divided. Okay, then verse 17. 
Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Simon has been involved in fraud and deceit for many, many years, and so he's ready for more of that. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast, uh, thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Now, there's lots of thoughts about this man Simon. Many think that he was not saved. And, and I'll you know, give some of the verses that we've just been reading that he, he could not possibly be saved. But it says back, back in verse 13, then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized. So I think you know, one of the problems many Christians have is they don't realize how wicked saved people can be. Amen how deceived and how deceitful saved people could be. I don't, you know, you can believe he's saved or not saved, but I don't see him doing anything here that a saved person couldn't do. Um, and so, again in verse 23, he says, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now, what, what is the gall of bitterness? Turn back to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy <coughs> 29 and um, verse 18. Now just look at this one verse. Uh, 29, 18. <coughs> Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. So gall has to do with idolatry, with, with false doctrine. Right? Back to chapter 8. Um, and so that's what Peter perceives about Simon in chapter 8, verse 23. He's in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Verse 24, Then answered Simon and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Uh, he's, I don't believe he's, when he says, Pray for me that none of these things will come upon me, I don't believe he's saying, Pray for me that I won't go to hell or won't go to the lake of fire. That's been taken care of back in verse 13. There's some other things that he's concerned about. The disciples had clearly been informed in the Old Testament <coughs> by Jesus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about some things that are to take place. And just keep this open, but turn back to Matthew 24, for example. Matthew 24. They clearly know that before Jerusalem will be saved, there are a number of things that are going to take place. So Matthew chapter 24, and beginning in verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And that's what Simon was doing, deceiving. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So the disciples know that, is there, there in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, they know that Matthew 24, 6, for example, has not yet taken place. But they're expecting that it will. And so there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Now this, this verse has been used more times than I can count. I've mm -hmm. read and heard this verse used to talk about how we know now that the end is near, that Christ is coming soon. 
Because look around the world today, look at the newspaper today. It's all around the world there's wars and rumors of wars. But, of course, one of the problems with that is that you can go all the way back to Genesis, to the very beginning of nations, and there's wars and rumors of wars. So how would, it, and there has been ever since then, including today, so how would this narrow things down or pinpoint things, if, if that's what it means? It wouldn't at all. Uh, what he's saying, and notice in verse 6 he says, for all these things must come to pass. Why must they come to pass? Because they're written in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that must come to pass unless it's written in the scriptures. Amen. But if it's written in the scriptures, then it must come to pass. So the wars and rumors of wars he's talking about, he's not talking about modern day Syria and Iraq and Libya and all this stuff going on. He's talking, because none of that is prophesied in the, in the Old Testament. He's talking about, for example, later on if you're bored and don't know what to do with your time, go back and read Daniel chapter 11. And you'll see something that that's what he's talking about. These wars and rumors of wars. Okay, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Here's something else that they know is going has to take place before the second coming of Christ, before Jerusalem will be saved. And again, many try to apply that to today. Um, verse 7 was very popular during World War I, and even more so during World War II. Because they, they look at verse 7, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and they think this is a world <coughs> war. So, you know, this must be it back in World War I days, and this must be it back in World War II days. Well, that wasn't it, and that wasn't it. And that thinking is completely wrong. <coughs> when you read this, you might think just superficially reading verse 7 that this has to be a world war. It's not a world war. You have to look in the Bible. It's, when you see a word or a phrase in the Bible, don't just assume it means something and don't just believe all the stuff you hear out there. You have to see in the Bible what does that mean. It's not talking about a world war. Uh, I don't have time to go further into it than that. But that it's, not, it's not what it's talking about. Um, verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and, and it goes on and on. So there, go back to Acts chapter 8. So they know that there are many things that must take place before, again, before Jerusalem will be saved, before the second coming of Christ. Uh, and so in Acts chapter 8, verse 24, when Simon says, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which he has spoken come upon me, I don't think he's talking about pray that I won't go to hell or pray that I won't go to the lake of fire. He's talking about the kind of things we were talking about in Matthew 24. Okay, verse 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. <coughs> so they're preaching in many villages of the Samaritans. And again, this is not because they think, oh, our program has been interrupted, and now we have to do something else. They don't know anything about any of that yet. They're doing what they're doing under the instruction that they've been given up to this point in the scriptures. And then verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And uh, we don't have time to go through every verse here, but um, Philip there comes across the Ethiopian eunuch, who is from Ethiopia, and he was a eunuch. Right? Turn to uh, Isaiah. We're going to again come right back. Turn to Isaiah chapter 56. And notice the Ethiop Ethiopian eunuch, it says, had come to Jerusalem to worship. So he clearly, again, is a believer. And we could. If we had more time, we could go back and, and I could show you a number of places in the Old Testament. The, the, the gospel had been in Eden, again, not the gospel we preach today, but the gospel had been in Ethiopia a long, long back during Old Testament times. So it's not real shocking that someone from Ethiopia would have heard about the God of Israel, and, but it is rather amazing, um, his faith, and that he goes to Jerusalem to worship. Now, 
Um, notice in Isaiah chapter 56 and beginning in verse 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Now we know the Ethiopian eunuch read in the book of Isaiah. That's clear in Acts chapter 8. And there's no doubt that he read this. Again in verse 3, Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. That's what the Ethiopian eunuch had done. Verse 5, Even unto them will I give in mine house, that would be the temple in Jerusalem, and that's where he went, and within my walls a place and a name better than of the sons and, and, and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and so forth. Okay, go back to Acts chapter 8. So that's what the Ethiopian eunuch wanted. He wanted that blessing in Isaiah 56. Okay, um, and so he comes in Acts 8.27, comes to Jerusalem to worship, and now he's returning from Jerusalem, going back home, and in verse 28, he's sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit tells Philip to, to go there and go to the chariot. Verse 8, Philip runs hither, and he hears him reading from Isaiah, and he says in verse 30, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, that's the issue. You have to understand what you're reading. Mm -hmm. There are people, there are churches where they're reading the Bible every week, sometimes every day. They don't understand what they're reading. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what you're reading. And of course, most don't want to understand. This unit wanted to understand. And so in verse 31, he says, how can I accept some man should guide me? And, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. And then it, he's reading in Isaiah chapter 53. So verse 32 and 33 come from Isaiah 53. And verse 34, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? When we go back, and we don't have time right now, but when we go back and read Isaiah 53 today, it's very clear, it ought to be, to us now, that that chapter is a prophecy about Jesus Christ and his death. <coughs> so you might think, how could this Ethiopian eunuch be so stupid as to not see that? And see, you have to, you can't bring Paul's epistles back into Acts chapter 8. They don't have that. So you have to consider only what has been revealed before this. Amen. And you know, how pathetic is it that this Ethiopian eunuch traveled all the way to Jerusalem to worship God? He did that. He's leaving Jerusalem and going back home. And he does not know who Isaiah 53 is about. What does that tell you about the state of Jerusalem? that time because he wa he desperately wants to know but he did not meet anyone in Jerusalem who could answer that question and so now he asks a question to Philip in verse 34 then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus because that's who that is about and as they went on their way they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said see here is water what doth hinder me to be baptized? See, this is clearly, again, the past dispensation. He knows that the nation of Israel needed to repent and to be baptized. So he's all down with the repenting and the believing, so now he wants to be baptized. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe what? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What did you have to believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to be saved? Jesus Christ is the Son. Not that Jesus died for his sins. He hadn't died. And even when Jesus told him, I will die, it says they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. 
he's not believing anything different in, in uh, verse 37 than what they had to believe before Jesus was crucified. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now let me ask you, as we sit here today, is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Amen. Yeah, of course he is. Let me ask you a second question. Do you have to believe today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God to be saved? Yes. And a lot of you are afraid to answer. Yes. I'm usually like that too. When a preacher asks a question, I don't want to make a fool of myself, so I keep my mouth shut. But Barney and a few others at least have the guts to nod their head. Yes, we, we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because if you don't believe he's the Son of God, then you're believing in another Jesus. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in the Jesus revealed in the Bible. And now, one more question. Will believing that Jesus is the Son of God save you today? No. No, it will not. We have to believe that Jesus, who is the Son of God, died for our sins today. That's not what was preached, not what they believed here in Acts chapter 8. And then... Uh, Quickly wrap it up, verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. By the way, this does not teach immersion by water baptism. Again, we're running out of time, but if you go back in Ezekiel 37 or 36 and some other places, you'll see they sprinkled them with water. So just because they went in water doesn't mean they burst. And then verse 40, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, which again is outside of Jerusalem. All right, and I'll stop there, and then Richard will pick it up. Father, we thank you for this time to continue uh, with our studies in the book of Acts, and I pray again as we look at these things that we would have a clear understanding dispensationally of where we're at, and that we would not try to read Paul's epistles back into these things, uh, and that we would make a clear distinction between what was taking place then and this present dispensation. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.